Welcome to Mooney Reads. My name is Beck, and today I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of March. I started out the month of March with Kasei San and Yamada Volume 2. This is the seventh volume of the Kasei San and series, and I really adore this series. The first five, well, all of them are really wholesome and cute. Um, the first five I was super in love with, but this one, and really the one right before it, there's a lot of jealousy involved and like some miscommunication with that and I just don't really like that. I'm not really a fan of that. I'm hoping that since they did talk it out that maybe this was just like a bump in the road and maybe they can focus on something else. Um, I definitely will still continue the series. This one just wasn't my favorite of the series. The next thing I finished after that was Artificial Condition by Martha Wells, which is the second book in the uh, Murderbot Diaries series. I listened to that one and then immediately after started Rogue Protocol, which was book three. And later in the month, I read book four, which is Exit Strategy. This is such a cool series. You cannot have my coffee, Sam. I'm sorry. I'm really loving the Murderbot series. The atmosphere that's created is spot on um it's totally immersive and i love uh thematically what's going on there's a lot of discussion about trauma and things like that looking at a lot of different things related to relationships i also think that there's something to be said about um like discussion of like neurodivergence to a certain extent and on top of that there's so much like just diversity within some of the minor characters and the overarching plot is cool um i've been listening to it on audiobook which is really wonderful um and definitely i think makes it even more immersive i really like uh the person that's narrating it i also read legends and lattes by travis baldry and i talk about this at length in the vlog that i recently put out it is so good. This was definitely one of my favorite fiction books that I read this month. I thought that it was going to be good. I've seen it hyped up on Book Talk most, I think, and it's supposed to be the softer, kind of low key fantasy of an orc starting a coffee shop. Um, very like D and D vibes, um, and also just a kind of I don't know if domestic is the right word because they're like building the coffee shop and figuring it out, but it's very low key. There is a bit of a plot in it that makes it a little bit more interesting. There's like a mafia or mob kind of situation in the town, but it's very good. Um, it's definitely hyped up for a reason, but it was so good. My favorite character was Thimble, who is... A little rat man that just loves to bake and loves coffee. He was not one of the main characters, but I that that was just something that I really adored. I also liked everything else too, but he was kind of the star of the show for me. I actually had a physical copy of this book, but I lent it out to one of my friends because I was so stoked about it and they wanted to borrow it. Um, I've talked about it with like everybody at work. And I think at least two or three of my coworkers have gotten a copy and we ordered a bunch in. Um, so it's been really fun to talk to people about. Next, I listened to the audiobook of Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics by Mark Lamont Hill and Mitchell Polinick. And this one was kind of disappointing. I've read Mar Mark Lamont Hill before. Um, we still hear, which I really enjoyed, and I thought it was a fairly complex look into current day, especially considering the size of the book. It's pretty small. So I was expecting this one to be pretty good. And it does go into some historical stuff that I wasn't aware of. He talks about um, the history of the United States kind of decisions and uh, relationship with Palestine and Israel and 
um, does talk a little bit about Palestinian history. However, the main premise of the book or the main focus is kind of this idea that the way that progressives treat Palestine is inconsistent with their ideals, um, which is true. Um, but I had a couple of issues with what he was saying. Plus, I didn't think that the book went far enough. And while I do think that the book, like, does go over historical facts politically and, like, the premise of the book, I feel like didn't really go past the title very much. Um, so, first, he kind of lumps in, at least in my understanding, like, I feel like I need to preface this with, like, maybe I need to go back and look at it because I was expecting it to be better. So maybe I missed something. Um, but lumping basically everything left of Republicans kind of in the U.S. framework as progressives, I think, is incorrect. But while I do agree with his assertion that, like, Democrats are just as much as fault as Republicans in how the United States has interacted with Palestine, I don't think that this one thing is, like, the exception that liberals make um i think that it would have been productive and important to talk about all of the other situations in which the united states hasn't stepped in to like help people who are victims of imperialism like if that's what the u.s is supposed to be doing which the U.S. is an imperialist country, so it doesn't make sense that they would help most people, especially when they benefit from certain people who are taken over by certain imperialist nations, depending on their relationship with the United States. Like, it really doesn't make sense that the U.S. would step in to all of these different countries who are having problems because the United States only steps in when it benefits them. That's not something that's unique to the Republican Party. That's how the United States works. Uh, they benefit from imperialism in a lot of instances. There are a lot of countries that have been decimated because the United States decided to use them for oil. Um, having wars, regardless of how people are treated. And in some cases, totally destroying governments from the inside because they don't like how their government is run. So... To say that Palestine is, like, the one country that's being ignored in the situation, I think is incorrect, because the United States has been culpable in a lot. So, I feel like that was a really long diatribe. Um, but all that is to say, I think that this book would have benefited from either talking about those other inconsistencies and talking about how Palestine fits into that framework, and or talking about like, the global situation with Palestine, because the United States is also not the only government involved in all. But anyways, that's a long way to say that, like, the book did talk about some technical things that I did not know about before and gave me a little bit more understanding, but it was a lot more politically shallow and didn't really move past the title. Um, I also didn't think that like, he talked about a lot of the issues, but then didn't really talk about, like, where to go from here or, like, what his position was and anything. He just said, these are, it felt, at least to me, most of what I retained was basically, here are the issues, here's what the United States has done, and that's it. Like, we didn't really progress from there very much. So, um, those were some of my thoughts reading it. After that, I read If Beale Street Could Talk. This is a classic American novel. It's James Baldwin. Uh, the whole premise is that, uh, the main character's boyfriend has been convicted of a crime that he didn't commit. And throughout the book, you're looking at what's happening now. Um, at the beginning of the book, uh, she finds out that she's pregnant and tells him. So she's dealing with that, and we're also going kind of back and forth in time looking at the development of their relationship. This was really beautifully written. Um, 
definitely heed the trigger warnings because a lot of this surrounds sexual assault and the way that it is handled by some of the characters is not very delicate so go on with that in mind um, but it was still a really beautiful book I loved it. I also watched the movie and really loved that as well. After that, I read Wake, The Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Revolts by Rebecca Hall. This is a graphic nonfiction that focuses on the history of women-led slave revolts, um, but it doesn't just look at what happened historically. This is actually more about one historian's experience trying to find this history. So it's kind of part memoir, part historical, because she does tell the stories of some of these women, but also talks about what it took to try to find some of this. She talks about the issues that come with trying to find something, things that are that old, trying to find like newspaper clippings from the 1700s. Also the issues with recording that went on during the time, actually recording like the gender of people who were enslaved who did this sort of thing that wasn't done very consistently and she herself as um a black woman lesbian historian faced a lot of different hurdles trying to put this stuff together she was followed around some of the places wasn't allowed in some of them um she was doing this research in the early 2000s i think but she also talks about um, not only her experience on that level, like actually getting this stuff, but also her personal and emotional experience. She talks about her ties to her ancestors and the emotional toll that this sort of research has. Um, so it was brilliant. I expected that I would like it because it's a graphic nonfiction and I love a good graphic nonfiction, but this exceeded my expectations and was just really incredible. Right before I read that one, actually, I listened to A Psalm for the Wild Built um, by Becky Chambers, and it was so good. It was another one of my favorite fictions, so A Psalm for the Wild Built and Legends and Lattes. They were both really soft, and I've heard a lot of good things about Becky Chambers. This was my first Becky Chambers book that I'd read. Um, uh, so I expected it to be good, but it exceeded my expectations and was so, like, warm and affirming in a really unexpected way. The whole premise of this is that you're focused on this monk who's basically trying to find himself. It's set in the society, um, after... They basically have robots automate everything. It got to the point where robots found consciousness and decided to wander off away from humans. So um, humanity has basically had to totally reorient its relationship with technology. So there are pieces of technology still present, but it's very different. Um, I think I described it as like steampunk meets cottagecore in the vibes um and i really loved it um this is another one that i vlogged about but it's in a vlog that's probably not going to be out for a minute um this and wake um and a couple of other things are in vlogs so you can look forward to that if you want to hear more of my direct thoughts because it was so warm and good um and would highly recommend it. And I'm so stoked to read Becky Chambers' other stuff. Um, in fact, if anyone has recommendations for soft, low-stakes sci-fi fantasy, please let me know about them. Because between A Psalm for the Wild Built and Legends and Lattes, like, I need way more of that in my life. After that, we can go right on back to nonfiction. I read The Philosophical Trends of the Feminist Movement by Anuradha Gandhi. And... Um, in this book, she breaks down different trends in Western feminism. She goes through and talks about liberal feminism, radical feminism, anarchic feminism, ecofeminism, socialist feminism, and postmodern feminism, um, or postmodern 
feminism's relationship with feminism. She talks a little bit about the history of each of these. Um, I think the ones with the most history in them were liberal and radical because those were really huge parts um, of second wave feminism and like liberal feminism was a big part of first wave too. She goes through, talks about each of these, and then critiques them. The author of this was in CPI Maoist, which is the Communist Party of India, so that's like the perspective that her critique comes through. So in a lot of this analysis, you know, there are considerations that like within all of these movements, it's largely white middle class women who are doing a lot of this. Um, so they're not considering women of color within the United States, certainly not women uh, within the global south. And ultimately, all of the techniques, all of the things they're talking about aren't really revolutionary. And of course, there are other different things within each one of these that are also a problem, and she outlines all of this. I thought this was really great critique. I only wish that there was more of it. It is pretty small. Um, this is, uh, oh, she's written other things as well, and I would be very interested to see what else there is kind of beyond this. After that was the Queer Weekend, um, the Queer Lit Readathon at the halfway point basically between their twice a year longer readathons. They have weekends that the focus is just to read queer books. So for that I read XXX's uh, Poems Par la Nation, Poems for the Nation by Raquel Salas Rivera. And this is a poetry collection that is mostly talking about Puerto Rico. He goes through and like talks about the country as a whole in section, talks about his family in sections, um, also some on queerness and kind of issues talking with his family, I think, or his family understanding kind of that piece. And also in some places talking about imperialism and uh, colonialism that directly impacts Puerto Rico. This was really beautiful. I, I mean, you can see I have several tabs in here um, of poems that were particularly powerful. One of the cool things about this collection is that all of the poems are told in English and in Spanish. Um, unfortunately, I can only read English um, or I can read very, very, very <laughs> like beginner Spanish. Um, so if I would recommend this to anyone who can read either English or Spanish, but if you're bilingual, um, uh, I think that they do this, they, they incorporate Spanish in multiple of their books because I also read for the 24 and 7 um, Boricuathon a few months ago, I read another one of their collections and that incorporated Spanish. Um, I would be really interested to see what all else there is because language is really layered and the act of translation and choosing different words um, is like there's a lot of intention in that anyways, especially in the medium of poetry. I would really be interested if somebody who is bilingual has read their work because uh, that would just be really cool to hear about. Um, but this was very good. During the 24 and 7, or no, not 24 and 7, during the Queer Weekend, I also started Last Night at the Telegraph Club, which I finished the Monday after. Last Night at the Telegraph Club is a young adult historical fiction that focuses on Lily, who is Chinese American in the 1950s and is figuring out that she's gay. Um, there are a lot of layers to the different things that she's dealing with. It talks about the Red Scare. Her dad in particular gets targeted and his immigration papers get taken away. Um, but on top of that, she's also dealing with being gay, trying to figure out her feelings and navigate like shame. Um, and she's also dealing with some different issues regarding her friendship. Not only, you know, you could think about friends potentially being homophobic, but even beyond that, kind of unpacking um, 
really what her friend expects out of her. Like there, there are other issues kind of within that, um, that are discussed a little bit. Overall, I really loved this. There are so many different details in here. Um, they, uh, when talking about Chinatown and the queer community, clearly a lot of research went into this. She actually has a really good author's note where she talks about the um, hard time that she had finding history of queer Asian American people during this time. Um, there's also a sources page or like bibliography that I'm really looking forward to taking a look at and um, seeing what I might could take from that and potentially read. One kind of critique that I have of this um, is that in certain sections of this, you kind of go back to the mom's perspective. So it kind of takes you back in time a little bit and talks about, is now really the time to have zoomies? All morning you've been sleeping. Can you do it in the kitchen at least? There. Throughout the book, you kind of dip back in time and see her mom's perspective. And that was really interesting. However, I don't think that I saw that thread totally completed. I feel like there needed to be a little bit more to justify why she did that. Like it was interesting, but I didn't really totally get why she did it. Um, the main reason that I could see, like the bits that I took out of it, was kind of looking at how her mom has had to change and adjust, kind of act a certain way for, like, in order to kind of be a part of this world. Like, when she's younger, she's more interested in, um, like, Chinese pop culture. She really wants to go back to China and to live, um, like, with the husband and his parents. And, uh, like, when they talk about politics, it's, like, they don't really have very strong opinions. They just want kind of the fighting to be over so that they can go back. Um, whereas in current day, like, towards the beginning, especially when the dad gets, uh, like, reprimanded um, for, like, being a doctor for someone who's been identified as a communist sympathizer. She goes on this kind of like very anti-communist, very like, uh, there's, there's a lot of like patriotism and stuff like that that seems really intense. And I think that seeing her background does kind of explain some of that, but I don't think that that was explicitly explored enough. Like that's, that's my like analysis and interpretation, but I, don't think that it was I thought that it should have been a little bit more direct um if that was the point which again there could be other pieces they did talk about a lot of other stuff in there and there were some other like parallels that were there but I didn't understand why like the mom and dad go to a date at a nightclub and I thought there would be something more direct happening but I didn't really see it unless there was supposed to be a comparison of like them going on a date versus like current day Lily going on a date. But like, I don't know, it wasn't very direct and it was kind of hard to parse through. So it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Um, that was just something like, I felt like there was a lot of room for some stuff to happen that didn't really happen. Like thematically, it's also worth noting that I've heard, uh, since reading it, I've heard of criticism from people of color looking at the relationship between Lily and Kat. Um, it is a interracial relationship. Kat is white. So I would definitely look for reviews from people of color, especially Asian people, um, kind of on that front. Because this book, I think, does address racism in a lot of different ways. It's not, you know, indirect or quiet about the kind of treatment that Lily gets from a lot of the white people like at school and uh, especially in the nightclub. But even though it's really directly addressed in those places, it isn't directly addressed within the relationship. Um, so I could definitely understand 
that critique. So definitely go looking for that. However, I feel like I spent a lot of time on the criticism of the book, but I did really love this. I love so many different things about it. I think I, I gave it like 4.75 stars or something like that. One of the things that really, really got me was just like how Lily talked about her attraction to women and also the shame, like how that was described. Like she didn't like, I don't know how to put it into words properly, but like in the beginning of the book, when even when she wasn't like totally sure of what she felt there were still so many details of like her averting her eyes her feeling that certain things were like she she wasn't supposed to be looking at them like it very much gave me the same feelings as like me being a teenager and like afraid to look in the direction of victoria's secret <laughs> like i understood the vibes and I thought that it was really well done. And throughout the course of the story, you can see her relationship with that kind of shame shift um, in the way that she talks to herself. And she even explicitly says, like, I should feel ashamed about this, but I don't. And that was just really nice. So that's Last Night at the Telegraph Club. Other than those things, I did work on several others. So I read part of Dear Centeron by Quake and Mezzi. And this is a Quake and Mezzi's memoir. I started reading it several months ago, but was in a bad kind of mental space, so I set it down and I was able to pick it back up this month. I have not finished. I really only got to read a few chapters, and the, the chapters are very short, but um, it's fucking brilliant and beautiful so far. And I plan on finishing it in April. And beyond that, I had a couple of buddy reads that I was working on. Um, Black Skin, White Masks by Friends Ben on. I'm reading with Brent. And we are almost done with. It is intense and brilliant. This is, uh, this is published in the 1960s and is a work of psychology with like sociology bits mixed in and like literary criticism and this basically talks about the mind of colonized people um different chapters kind of focus on different elements but it's mostly focused on the psychology of um black people and colonized nations and finally the other buddy read that i'm doing um is you will get through this night a practical mental health guide by daniel howell i'm buddy reading this with my friend amanda and it's been pretty good. It's got a lot of honestly kind of basic advice, but having, I feel like all of this in one book is good. Um, I mean, I've been tabbing little uh, activities that I can do. And I think that having them in one spot that I can actually like, you know, just open up the book and kind of do it is going to be helpful for me personally. And um, you know, as much as I've heard some of this advice from people before, um, it's different seeing it in a book and maybe a little extra motivation to actually follow through on it. Um, when a YouTuber from 2015 that I have some nostalgia around is telling me to do it. Um, so that's been a good time. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. She's sitting in my lap now. So that is what my reading looked like for the month of March. If you've read any of these, definitely let me know about it in the comments. Um, and let me know about your favorite read from March. Thank you all so much for watching. Bye.